internet, I'm Steve, and this is Raffo. Before we jump into the video today, we've got a couple announcements. First, this is obviously a different space than I was recording in before. My son's now old enough to have his own room, which means he stole my studio space. So, I had to get a different run. Now we have lovely white walls instead of wood paneling. Also, I turned 30. Anyway, most people, when they talk about white sand, are talking about this, or this, or this. For we Branderson Sanderson Fandersons, we still could be talking about this, or this, or at this point, even this. Today, though, we're going to talk about this. But first, let's talk about this. Taldane, the planet of white sand, is a geographical oddity. Two weeks from everywhere. Tidally locked between two stars, it probably sits in the L1 Lagrange point of the system, a gravitationally stable point between two masses where the apex of the Roche lobes of each mass touch, basically in the middle of a tug-of-war between two stars. If we represent those gravitational forces three-dimensionally, Taldane should sit right here, in the little saddle between the two star wells. The likelihood of the planet ending up there naturally is astronomically small, and when you look at the actual landscape of at least Dayside, it's pretty obvious that Taldane was artificially created and sustained. Most likely, this was done by Bavadin, the Shard of Autonomy. Bavadin, as a shard, has the ability to create autonomous avatars. Not splinters of itself, per se, but representations of her shard that themselves are considered shards, in a way. In fact, there are apparently entire pantheons of gods, where each one is just another aspect of autonomy. We've seen several of her avatars already. Paji in First of the Sun, potential fiddling with Scadriel, a pen pal on a Brodi, and most notably the Sand Lord on Taldane, also known as the Sun. And also probably these faces in the clouds. And this guy. And maybe this guy? Because it's trapped between two stars, a blue-white supergiant, autonomy, and a white dwarf shrouded in a particulate ring, maybe also autonomy, half the planet is bathed in eternal day and the other half in never-ending twilight, with each hemisphere containing its own autonomous continent. We haven't seen any of Darkseid yet, though I hear they have cookies. The landmass on Dayside is roughly circular, with a single big mountain in the very center, and is basically completely covered in, that's right, white sand. I don't like sand. This sand is coated in a microorganism that, when exposed to the investiture which beats down from the Dayside sun with the light, turns white. In fact, it's theoretically possible to harness the investiture wherever the light from that star reaches. Anyway, when used by a sandmaster or otherwise exposed to water, the investiture is released in a flash of shifting colors, and the sand turns black, only regaining its white color, presumably re-investing, after four hours of sun exposure. Sandmasters are able to channel the release of that investiture by using their body's own water supply to control ribbons of sand. No, not like... oh. Actually, yeah, kind of like that. These ribbons can be used to both attack and defend, manipulate objects, even to basically fly if the Sandmaster can control enough. Most Sandmasters can control between three to two dozen. However, the more ribbons of sand you control, the faster your water supply diminishes. Naturally, dehydration is a huge risk for a Sandmaster, and if they use too much of their water supply, called overmastery, they can lose their ability to control sand, and even die, almost becoming an instant mummy as all the water in their body gets sucked out. Sandmaster has a unique solution to its dangerous sucking of water. Powerful Sandmasters can learn an ability called Slatrification, which can actually turn white sand into water. This isn't the first time in the Cosmere we've seen something turned into something else, so perhaps sand mastery and soul casting are more fundamentally related? According to Brandon, there are other, more ingenious uses of sand mastery that we haven't even seen yet. We're not sure exactly how someone becomes a sand master, though there may be a genetic component. However, a sand master's strength is apparently fixed. Control and precision can be developed through training, but the amount of sand you can control cannot be increased. Unless... Well, read the pros. For this reason, a Sandmaster's rank in the Diem, basically the Sandmaster Guild, cannot be changed. Once you accept a rank, you're in that rank for life. Unless... Uh, 
read the graphic novel. There are eight ranks in the Diem of the Sand. Anyone with any talent in Sand Mastery can join and become an Acolyte, where most students train for about four years before accepting their permanent rank. The Diem is led by the Lord Mastral, who is a member of the highest rank, the Mastrals. Under them are the Under Mastrals, then lesser is the Lestrals. Under the Lestrals are predictably the under Lestrals, then comes in order the Diem Fens, Fens, and Under Fens. Say that quick and it sounds like... A Sandmaster's rank is entirely based on their raw ability. If you can control more sand, you'll be put into a higher rank. If you can't control very much, you get stuck with the Under Fens. The Sandmaster Diem is one of eight ruling professions in Lawson, along with cops, Soldiers, sailors, merchants, farmers, artisans, and masons, with an unofficial lord beggar among the other profession heads. Lawson stretches in a wedge from the center mountain, Cray Da, down to the southern coast, about five to seven o'clock. They've got sandmasters, and their neighbors to the west, the nation of Kirsta, hates them for it. The Kirstians are currently ruled by a noble merchant class, so they haven't killed very many people recently. Bad for business. The priest class in that nation has been rising again in power, so tensions between them and Lawson have been increasing as well. Moving back center, the Kurla surrounds most of Kreda, a possibly unclaimed region of undesert that the Sandmasters like to hang out in. Then there's the Rim Kingdoms, four little countries in the northeast who we've never heard of. Most of these places, daysiders wouldn't actually consider as desert, even though it's covered in sand, has virtually no trees, and the sun never wavers from its fixed point in the sky. The distinction between desert and non-desert is the presence of an incredibly convenient plant called a dorim vine, which grows under the sand and carries with it a significant supply of clean water. Pouring water onto the sand causes these vines to rise to the surface, and the water they contain is used as a protection against sandlings and other creatures whose carapace shells are often dissolved by water. Difficult to eat something if your mouth falls apart every time you take a bite. These shells are often referred to as turkin, meaning that while they go goopy in water, they are also impervious to sand mastery, causing controlled sand that comes in contact with it to lose its investiture and turn black. I mentioned sandlings in a previous video, and when considered in relation to everything we know about life in our universe, they don't really make sense. A living thing that is basically allergic to water? The graphic novel makes this even more difficult to reconcile, because they're depicted as having liquid saliva. And this is where we get to my theory. Sandlings need water, because they actually feed off investiture. First, the experiments done by Chrysala in White Sand 2 show that sand that has passed through the digestive system of a sandling has been stripped of the investiture-absorbing microorganism, making it similar to dark side sand. This implies that sandlings eating white sand must be a common enough occurrence for post-digested sand to be possible to retrieve. Second, while it's known that sandlings will avoid areas where dorum vines grow because of the large amounts of water, we also see various species attack and consume living, carbon-based, water-filled prey. Uh. So water must not be fatal to them, or else consuming a person whose body is made of 80% water would kill them. It must just dissolve carapace. Third, sandlings, like great shells, do not obey the square cube law. They should collapse under their own weight, but sandlings don't have the benefit of decreased gravity or floaty spren bonds, which means there must be something else keeping them alive. What better way than pure investiture? So what if they don't consume larger prey for nourishment, but rather for a water reserve? Then they use that water housed within their digestive tract to activate the white sand that they consume, sparking the investiture into a kinetic state and absorbing it. The microflora coating the sand is then also consumed and used to build the Turkin carapace. Because it's no longer invested, it appears black or gray, but is still sensitive to water and starts to unbind when it comes into contact with it. Similarly, when a Turkin carapace touches kinetically invested sand, those same macromolecules either spark or leach away the investiture, making sand mastery ineffective. Sandlings can then be thought of as sort of a giant earthworm, eating dirt, absorbing necessary nutrients, then pooping out the stripped minerals. Also kind of like any number of birds that eat rocks, which they store in their gizzard and use to help digest food. Sandlings just have a sort of water gizzard. 
Chris also draws a connection to the coating on the sand grains of Dayside with a lichen that apparently grows on everything on Darkside. Her entry on Taldane in Arcanum Unbounded implies that there is some form of investiture access on Darkside, but we don't know if there is a connection here or not. There seems to be at least something going on on Darkside, as Skathen, the emperor of the dynasty over there, has been ruling for at least a hundred years and still looks like he's in his mid-twenties. Oh gosh. He's the emperor of the dark side. Speaking of immortal god kings, in my next video we're finally going to talk about my very favorite books, the Mistborn Trilogy. And that will be the end of this investiture analysis series. If you've missed any videos, take a look here. Please like and subscribe, and as always, read and find out.